Hello everybody and welcome to Brighton Beach Memoirs. Um, one of my favorite plays to teach mostly because it's funny and it just tells a good story. Now, uh, the, the one of the themes in this play that we're going to highlight is just the theme of family and how um, a good family needs to support each other and that's a, a, a helpful way to get through life is with the support of your family. So we're going to take a look at this. It reminds me a lot of um, A Raisin in the Sun in that they too needed each other in order to survive. I mean, think about how the, the youngers would have made it if they didn't have each other to lean on um, during the bad times and the good. Um, and it's the same thing today for our, our family that we're going to be reading about today. And they are the Jerome family. Now, interestingly, it also takes place around the same time that Raising the Sun takes place. Now, that was in the 1945, 1944 time period. This is 1937, which is very similar. So think about what's going on in America at this time. Uh, the Great Depression has just ended about three or four years ago. So having a job is still a really big deal. They're hard to come by. We're going to find out in this novel that the main, that the the father of the house, of the family, he actually has to work two jobs, an eight or nine hour day at one. And then he works in the evenings as well to make ends meet. Why? Because he has to take care of his sister-in-law. So check this out very quickly. It's the father, his wife, and then his two sons. And they took in the wife's sister and her two daughters because the wife's sister's husband died. So think about what this father has to go through, how he has to take, you know, he has to, he has to support everybody. Um, and it's, it's a big deal, especially in 1937 to have those jobs and to keep them. So we'll talk about that. They are poor um, and they do struggle. Um, let's go. I don't want to talk too much because uh, you don't want me to talk too much. You want me to read. So allow me to get myself ready and let's go. Brighton Beach, New York, September 1937. A wooden frame house, not too far from the beach. It is a lower middle income area inhabited mostly by Jews, Irish, and Germans. The entrance to the house is to the right, a small porch and two steps up that lead to the front door. Inside, we see the dining room and living room area. Another door leads to the kitchen. A flight of stairs leads up to three small bedrooms. Unseen are two other bedrooms. A hallway leads to other rooms. It is around 6.30 and the late September sun is sinking fast. Kate Jerome, about 40, is setting the table. Her sister, Blanche Morton, 38, is working at a sewing machine. Lori Morton, age 13, is lying on the sofa reading a book. Outside in the grass stands Eugene Jerome, almost but not quite 15, so he's 14. He is wearing knickers, a shirt and tie, a faded and torn sweater, Ked sneakers, and a blue baseball cap. I want to point something out. His sweater, they, call, they say it's faded and torn. It's just indicative of the fact that they are not necessarily poor, but they're definitely not well-to-do, that they struggle. I guess you could say they're poor, um, but you know they, they eat, just they struggle. Um, Let's continue. He has a beaten and worn baseball glove on his left hand, and in his right hand, he holds a softball that is so old and battered, it is ready to fall apart. Just take a look at that. His, his, what he's playing with is the, the, the softball is so old that it's falling apart in his hands, but he can't get another one because they are, you know, struggling. Let's go. On an imaginary pitcher's mound facing left, he looks back over his shoulder to an imaginary runner on second, then back over to the batter. Then he winds up in pitches, hitting an offstage wall. Eugene. One out, a man on second, bottom of the seventh, two balls, no strikes. Ruffing checks the runner on second, gets the sign from Dickey. Ruffing stretches, roughing pitches, he throws the ball. Caught the inside corner, Steve Reich, one out, a baby, no hitter up there, he retrieves the ball. One out, a man on second, bottom of the seventh, two balls, one strike. Ruffing checks the runner on second, gets the sign from Dickey. Ruffing stretches, roughing pitches, he throws the ball. Low and outside, ball three, come on, Red, make him a hitter, no batter up there. In there all the time, Red. Blanche, stop sewing. Kate, please. My head is splitting. Kate, I told that boy 109 times. She yells out, Eugene, stop banging the wall. So let's just talk about the irony here, right? So you have Eugene is outside playing softball with himself. He's, he's a 14-year-old kid. He's having fun. He's actually he has a pretty good imagination. He's pretending he's in the World Series, right? Inside, you have Aunt Blanche who's sewing, and she says, I have a headache. Can you ask him to stop, please? And Kate, how does she get him to stop? making noise, she yells at him to stop making noise. I'd just like to point out the irony of that. Mom is kind of a hypocrite. We'll find out more about that as we go on. Eugene calls out, in a minute, Ma, this is for the World Series. Back to his game. One out of men on second, bottom of the seven, three balls, one strike, roughing stretches, roughing pitches. He throws the ball. Oh, no, high and outside. Jojo Moore walks, first and second, and Mel Ott lopes up to the plate. Blanche stops again. Can't he do that someplace else? Kate. 
I'll break his arm. That's where he'll do it. <laughs> Hold on. And she calls out, Eugene, I'm not going to tell you again. Do you hear me? Eugene, it's the last batter, Mom. Mel Ott is up. It's a crucial moment in World Series history. Your Aunt Blanche has a splitting headache. Blanche, I don't want him to stop playing. It's just the banging. Lori looks up from her book. He always does it when I'm studying. I have a big test in history tomorrow. Eugene, one pitch, Ma? I think I can pop, get him to pop up. I have my stuff today. Kate, your father will give you plenty of stuff when he comes home. You hear? Eugene, all right, all right. Kate, I want you inside now. Put out the water glasses. Blanche, I can do that. Kate, why? Is his arm broken? She yells out again. And I don't want any back talk, you hear? Now, first of all, there's no problem with the mom having the son do some chores at the table. But the aunt just said she could do it. Why not let the boy continue to have a couple of moments of playtime and let her do it? Why does she force the boy to do it? And does she force the girl to do it as well? Let's find out about that. She goes back to the kitchen. Eugene slams the ball into his glove angrily. Then he cups his hands, making a megaphone out of it, and announces to the grandstand, Attention, ladies and gentlemen. Today's game will be delayed because of my Aunt Blanche's headache. Kate, Blanche, that's enough sewing today. That's all I need is for you to go blind. Blanche, I just have to finish this one edge. Lori, darling, help your Aunt Kate with the dishes. Lori, two more pages, all right, Ma? I have to finish the Macedonian Wars. Kate, always oh, studying that one. She's going to have some head on her shoulders. She calls out from the kitchen, Eugene, Eugene, I'm coming. Kate, and wash your hands. Eugene, they're clean. I'm wearing a glove. He throws the ball into his glove again, and then he looks out front and addresses the audience. I hate my name. All right, first of all, I want to point something out. Eugene is doing something in this play, which you see in a lot of plays, a lot of good plays. Shakespeare does it a lot, where you have what's called the aside. And the aside is when one of the characters breaks from all the action, turns to the audience, and talks to them. Now, all the other characters are there, but they can't hear them because we're hearing the thoughts of the character who's giving the aside. We can also believe that whatever they're saying is really their thoughts. They're not going to lie to us because we're just hearing inside their head. Let's go. I hate my name. Eugene Morris Jerome. It is the second worst name ever given to a male child. The first worst is Haskell Fleischman. How am I ever going to play for the Yankees with a name like Eugene Morris Jerome? You have to be a Joe or a Tony or a Frankie. If only I was born Italian. All the best Yankees are Italian. My mother makes spaghetti with ketchup. What chance do I have? He slams the ball into his glove again. Lori, I'm almost through, Ma. Blanche, all right, darling, but don't get up too quickly. All right, first of all, stop. Why would you tell a 13-year-old girl not to get up too quickly? The only reason I could think about it is maybe lately she's been sick, like she's getting over an illness, right? And like, watch what Kate says to Lori. You have better color today, sweetheart. Did you get a little sun this morning? All right, first of all, definitely sounds like she's getting over something because you look a little better today. And Lori says, I walked down to the beach. And Blanche, her mother says, very slowly, I hope. Yes, Ma. That's good. All right. Why would you want a kid to walk slowly? What's wrong with Lori? They're implying that something is wrong with Lori. Let's figure this out. Eugene turns to the audience. Oh, we're going to find out right now. She gets all this special treatment because the doctors say she has, oh, I pressed the wrong button. Hold on a second. Oh, crap. There it is. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. Hold on a second, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there it is. She gets all this special treatment because the doctors say she has a kind of flutter in her heart. All right. First of all, a flutter in your heart. That's just a, an irregular heartbeat, right? I actually have students, there may be one or two of you watching this now that have an irregular heartbeat. It means nothing. Instead of going boop, 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 it goes boop, 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 boop. It does something irregular. And you know what it means? Nothing. You can run, you can play, you can dance, you can skip. It's all good. In 1937, did they know that? You know what? I think they did. Um, I think that the mom is using this as an excuse to baby her daughter. Now, we're going to find out, and I think I already told you that the father died. Maybe that's why. But the problem is when you baby somebody like that, when you do everything for them, they become spoiled, right? And uh, other people don't like them that much. And also, uh, well, let's just keep going. Let's see what we see. I got hit with a baseball right in the back of my skull. I saw two of everything for a week, and I still had to carry a block of ice home every afternoon. Girls are treated like queens. Maybe that's what I should have been born. An Italian girl. Kate picks up a sweat sock from the floor. Eugene! Eugene, what? Kate, how many times have I told you not to leave your things around the house? 109. What? You said yesterday, I told you 109 times not to leave your things around the house. Blanche, 
don't be fresh to your mother, Jean, Eugene, to the audience. Was I fresh? I swear to God, that's what she said to me yesterday. One day I'm going to put all this in a book or a play. I'm going to be a writer like Ring Lardner or somebody. That's if things don't work out first with the Yankees or the Cubs or the Red Sox or maybe possibly the Tigers. If I get down to the St. Louis Browns, then I'll definitely be a writer. All right. Now, interestingly enough, is this kid going to become a, a Yankee? Probably not. Or a Red Sox? Probably not. But a writer, would he be a good writer based upon the fact that he has such an imagination and how he speaks? I'm saying, yeah, he'd probably be a really great writer. Maybe a good reporter. Maybe a sports reporter would be a good idea for him. We're also going to find out in a minute that he writes everything down in his memoirs, which is a diary. In fact, think about the name of this play. It's called Brighton Beach Memoirs. It's somebody's diary. Well, guess whose diary it is, ladies and gentlemen? We're getting this from the perspective of Eugene. It's his diary. Listen. Mom, can I have a glass of lemonade? Blanche, it'll spoil your dinner, darling. A small glass, it couldn't hurt her. All right, in a minute, Angel. Kate, I'll get it. It's in the, I'm in the kitchen anyway. All right, did you hear that, Lori? She gets whatever she wants. Imagine if Eugene just asked for a glass of lemonade. They'll probably laugh in his face. Eugene to the audience. Can you believe that? She'd never have a bad heart or I'm gonna kill her one day. He gets up to walk into the house, then stops on the porch steps and turns to the audience again, confidentially. Listen. I hope you don't repeat this to anybody. What I'm about to tell you are my secret memoirs. It is called The Unbelievable, Fantastic, and Completely Private Thoughts of I, Eugene Morris Jerome, in this, the 15th year of his life, in the year 1937, in the community of Brighton Beach, Borough of Brooklyn, Kings County, City of New York, Empire State of the American Nation. Kate comes out of the kitchen with a glass of lemonade and one roller skate. A roller skate? On my kitchen floor? Do you want me dead? Is that what you want? Eugene rushes into the house. I didn't leave it there. Kate, no. Then who? Lori? Um, Blanche? Did you ever see them on skates? She holds out the skate. Kick this upstairs. Come here. Eugene approaches, holding the back of his head. Don't hit my skull. I have a concussion. Now, interestingly enough, he holds the back of his head when he walks by his mom because she does regularly whack him on the back of the head. Now, is he a knucklehead? Sometimes, yes. But does she treat him fairly? The answer is no. Listen. Kate handing the glass to Lori. What would you tell your father if he came home and I was dead on the kitchen floor? Eugene, I'd say, don't go in the kitchen, Pa. Kate swings at him. He ducks and she misses. Get upstairs and don't come down with dirty hands. All right, but I do want to point something out. Does she love him? The answer is unequivocally, yes. And he loves her too. It's a very loving family. Are they both sarcastic? Yes, continue. Eugene goes up the stairs. He turns to the audience. You see where I want to write all this down? In case I grow up all twisted and warped, the world will know why. Blanche, still sewing. He's a boy. He's young. You should be glad he's healthy and active. Before the doctors found out what Lori had, she was the same way. All right, stop right there. Did you hear that? She just said, before the doctors found out what Lori had, she was the same way. Healthy and active. In other words, if she was healthy and active before they found out the heartbeat, why wouldn't she be healthy and active afterwards? She's keeping Lori down. And the worst part to me is Lori's letting herself be kept down. Why? So she could be spoiled. So she doesn't have to do any work. Kate, never. Girls are different. When you and I were girls, we kept the house spotless. It was Ben and Ezra who drove mama crazy. We see Eugene upstairs enter his room and take out a notebook and pencil and lie down on his bed, making a new entry in his memoirs. I've always been like that. I have to have things clean, just like mama. The day they packed up and left the house in Russia, she cleaned the place from top to bottom. She said, no matter what the Cossacks did to us, when they broke into our house, they would have respect for the Jews. All right, guys and gals, I am no history teacher. Um, not at all. <laughs> you know that. But what I'm, what she's saying here is back, they're Jewish people. They lived in Russia. And at some point, these people, these Cossacks, I guess they were just bad Russians. What I'm guessing is they were like the bad government Russians. Totally guessing. Um, they came in and they kicked all the Jews out and they stole everything from them. Now, is it okay for Kate to be mad at the Cossacks for doing that to her and her family? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, is it okay for Kate to be mad at all people who aren't her family, who aren't Jewish, to be mad at all of them? And the answer is absolutely not. We're going to find out in a moment that Kate thinks that all people who are not Jewish people are not trustworthy and they are bad people. And guys and gals, that is the definition of a racist, right? Um, and she's also very stereotypical. You're going to see that in a moment as well. Kate is a good mom, but she is not a good person. And you're going to see that as we go through this play. Please continue. Lori, who are the Cossacks? Kate, the same filthy bunches live across the street. Lori, across the street, you mean the Murphys? All of them. 
All right, now, first of all, Murphy's. Does that sound like a Russian name? And the answer is no. Murphy is an Irish name, actually. Um, why does she hate the Irish people across the street? And why? Because they are not like her and her family. Listen, Lori, the Murphys are Russian. Blanche, the mother is nice. She's been very sweet. She's been very sweet to me. Kate, her windows are so filthy. I thought she had black curtains hanging inside. Blanche, I was in their house. It was very neat. Nobody could be as clean as you. What business did you have in their house? Blanche, she invited me for tea. Kate, to meet that drunken son of hers. Now, why does she call the son a drunk? Is it because he's Irish and she's using the stereotype that all Irish men, Irish people are all drunkards? Sounds like it. Blanche, no, just the two of us. Well, I'm been living here 10 years. She never invited me for tea. Now, interesting. Why hasn't she been invited for tea? Because she's not nice. Why would anybody invite Kate over for tea if that's how she's going to treat people? Because she knows your situation. I know they're kind. Remember what mama used to tell us, stay on your own side of the street. That's what they have gutters for. Ah, oh, so now we know where Kate learns to be this way from her mother. My question is, why not Blanche? It's good that Blanche isn't, but I guess you can see if you have a bad parent, not everybody learns from the parents the bad things that they teach them. I don't think Eugene is that way from his mom. Let's continue. She goes back into the kitchen. Eugene writing says aloud. That's what they have gutters for to the audience. If my mother knew I was writing all this down, she would stuff me like one of her chickens. I'd better explain what she meant by Aunt Blanche's situation. You see her husband, Uncle Dave, he died six years ago from, he looks around, this thing. They never say the word. They always whisper it. It was cancer. I think they're afraid if they say it out loud, God would say, I heard that. You said the dread disease. He points his fingers down. Just for that, I smite you down with it. There are some things that grown-ups just won't discuss. For example, my grandfather, he died from diphtheria. Anyway, after Uncle Dave died, he left Aunt Blanche with no money, not even insurance. And she couldn't support herself because she has asthma. So my big-hearted mother insisted we take her and her kids to live with us. So they broke up our room into two small rooms. And me and... Wait a minute. We got our room in two small rooms and me and my brother Stan live on this side and Lori and her sister Lauren live on the other side. My father thought it would just be temporary, but it's been three and a half years so far. And because of that, I think because of Aunt Blanche's situation, my father is developing high blood pressure. Listen to that. Listen to what they did. They took the, the, the sister and the, the two daughters into their home, even though they don't really have enough money to pay for their family. And notice they, they took the boys, shared a small room upstairs. They cut that room in half. They put a wall between it. And now the boys live in half a room and the girls live in the other half of the room. Also think about this. Dad goes and works that second job just to pay for everything for these people, all their clothes, all their medicine, all their food for the home, everything. And now we just found out that the dad has high blood pressure. What happens if the dad has a heart attack and passes away and dies? What happens to this family? Where are they then? He resumes his writing. Kate comes out of the kitchen with a pitcher and says to Lori, have some more lemonade, dear. <laughs> Look at that. Lori even gets more. Lori sits up. Thank you, Aunt Kate. Blanche, drink it slowly. Lori, I am. Kate looks at Blanche. Blanche, that's enough already. Since seven o'clock this morning. Blanche, I was just stopping. Kate, you'll sew your fingers together. Blanche, it's getting dark anyway. She stops, sits back and rubs her eyes. I think I need new glasses. Lori, our teacher said you should change them every two years. Kate to Blanche, would it kill you to put a light on? Blanche, I don't have to run up electric bills. I owe you and Jack enough as it is. So check that out. Blanche feels bad that she's staying there and she tries not to suck up a lot of their money, like use their electricity. She probably doesn't eat as much as she should. Probably, right? My question is, why doesn't she go out and get a job of herself? I mean, clearly the husband who died took care of their family. Why doesn't she go out and try to get a job? Interesting. Maybe we'll find out throughout this play. Kate, have I asked you for anything? Do you see anybody starving around here? If I go hungry, you'll give me something from your plate. Blanche, Kate, I'm going to pay you and Jack back someday. I don't know when, but I keep my word. Kate, from your lips to the Irish sweepstakes, go in and taste the soup. See if it needs salt. Blanche goes into the kitchen. Lori, should I put out the water glasses or is Eugene going to do it? Now, interestingly enough, Lori knows that if she asks that question, what's the mom going to do? She's going to make Eugene do it, which is why Eugene, I mean, Lori says that. Eugene, having heard, slams his memoir shut angrily. Kate yells up, Eugene, it's the last time I'm going to tell you to Lori. Just do the napkins, darling. She goes into the kitchen. Lori gets up and starts to set out the napkins. Eugene sits up on his bed and addresses the audience. Because of her condition, I have to do twice as much work around here. Boy, if I could just make the Yankees, I'd be in St. Petersburg this winter. He starts out and down the stairs. Her sister Nora isn't too bad. She's 16. I don't mind her much. 
He was downstairs by now. At least she's not too bad to look at. He starts taking down some glasses from this open cupboard. To be absolutely honest, this is the year I started noticing girls that weren't too bad to look at, nor started developing about eight months ago. I have the exact date written in my diary. Oh, OMG. Um, yes, now we're understanding why Eugene likes the sister Nora better than he likes the sister. And remember, this is his cousin, all right? Eugene is clearly going through puberty. He's 14. Um, and yeah, we're going to see more as this book continues. Nora. I'm um, suddenly we hear a voice. It is Nora. Nora. Mom, Lori, Aunt Kate. We see Nora, an absolutely lovely 16 and a half year old girl with a developed chest bound across the front steps and into the house. She is bubbling over with enthusiasm. I've got incredible news, everybody. Eugene, hi, Nora. Nora, Eugene, my sweet, adorable, handsome cousin. Wait till I tell you what's happened to me. She throws her arms around him, hugs him close and kisses his cheek. Then she rushes into the other room to Lori. I'm fainting. I'm absolutely fainting. All right. She just grabbed Eugene and gave him a big hug. Watch what Eugene says. Luckily, not out loud. This is another aside. So he's saying it to us, the audience. Eugene, still stunned from the hug, turns to the audience. I felt her chest. When she grabbed me, I felt my first chest. Nora. I can't believe this whole day. Lori, what happened? Nora, where's mom? Aunt Kate, I have to tell everyone. She rushes to the kitchen door. Everybody inside for the big news. Kate and Blanche come out of the kitchen. Kate is mashing potatoes in a pot. Kate, what's all the excitement? Blanche, you're all red in the face. Nora, sit down, mom, because I don't want you fainting on the floor. Kate, sit down, Blanche. Lori, mom, sit down. Blanche sits. All right, now, first of all, this is a 16-year-old girl. She's very excited. She's very dramatic. Is that something that 16-year-olds do? Do they get very excited and dramatic, highly emotional, highly excited? The answer is yes. Let's find out what this news is. She thinks it's faint-worthy. Let's see. Nora, you too, Aunt Kate. Okay, is everybody ready? Lori, stop. Spence is killing me. Blanche, don't say things like that, Lori. Kate, to the others. Can I hear what the girl has to say? To Nora. Go ahead, darling. Nora, a little breathless. Okay, here goes. I'm going to be in a Broadway show. All right, first of all, a Broadway show for a 16-year-old girl, that would be a huge deal. And I'm not just talking about the fact that she would make a ton of money, which this family can use, but I'm talking about like, wow, that's really incredible to be in a Broadway show when you're 16 years old. You have to be amazingly good at singing and dancing and acting and, you know, reading, whatever it is you're doing on a Broadway show. I don't know. Listen. They all look at her in a stunned silence. Now, <laughs> they're stunned. Why? She doesn't act, guys and gals. She's, we found, we'll find out she's in a dancing class, but she's not an actor or a singer. So why would a Broadway show want this girl? Think about that. Let's go on. It's a musical called Abracadabra. This man, Mr. Beckman, he's a producer, came to our dancing class this afternoon and he picked out three girls. We have to be at the Hudson Theater on Monday morning at 10 o'clock to audition for the dance director. But on the way out, he took me aside and said the job was as good as mine. All right, now, first of all, that weirds me out. Why did he say that to her? What's going on here? She says, I have to call him tomorrow. I may have to go into town to talk to him about it. So now this man wants to see this 16-year-old girl, like talk to her alone, have her come in and, and audition for him alone. I'm getting bad feelings about this, ladies and gentlemen. Very bad feelings. They start rehearsing a week from Monday, and then it goes to Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Washington. And then it comes to New York the second week in December. There are nine big musical numbers, and there's going to be a big tank on the stage that you can see through, and the big finale. It all takes place with the entire cast all underwater. I mean, can you believe it? I'm going to be in a Broadway show, mama. They're all still stumped. Kate, Blanche to Kate. What is she talking about? <laughs> Kate, do I know? Am I her mother? So they don't even know what the heck she's talking about. Now think about this. Regardless of whether it's on the level, whether or not this guy is a real director, whether he really wants to put her in a play or not. And I don't know. I doubt it completely, but I don't know. The fact that he didn't ask for a parent, how old she was, for a parent to come or for her to come with anybody else also weirds me out. But here's this. Would you allow your 16-year-old kid to quit high school and travel around the country with a bunch of strangers in a play? The answer would be, I hope not, right? High school is kind of a little more important. And if you really are a good actor or actress, then that'll still be there when you get out of high school. In fact, you could practice more and become even better. Lori, how can you be in a show? Don't you have to sing and act? Blanche, I'm sorry, Nora, I can sing. Lori, no, you can't. <laughs> Nora, a little. No, you can't. Nora, I can carry a tune. 
Lori, Lori. No, you can't. Now, first of all, is Lori being mean by telling her this? And the answer is maybe, but not for nothing. Would Lori know that her sister can sing or not? And the answer is yes, she's lived with her all this time. And she said, you can't even carry a tune. So if you're going to be in a Broadway show, a musical, you're going to have to do some singing. And she says, dude, you can't even sing. So um, everything seems a little weird right now. And by the way, that's the end of assignment number one. Really nice job, everybody. Please make sure you get all those questions answered. Have a lovely day and we'll meet back here first. Assignment number two.